As you can see, a huge text that says Princess Mononoke comes out on a screen, and you can see the patterns drawn in the back of it, right? This is a clay mask. It's a type of mask which has been excavated from a ruin of Jomon period and worn by its people, a mask made by burning its surface. These are the pictures, and you can find these images on Google. If you look in the back of the title scene, you can see these patterns. Even the storyboard says these are patterns painted on a clay mask in red-orange, but you can't really tell what it is by glance, can you? So I got rid of the text Princess Mononoke out of this image. No, this is it. Even so, you can't tell what's drawn here, so... Can you see? So what's this? It's actually an image of a monster with one eye with a bunch of horns. What's drawn here is a pattern from Jomon period, but it's also an image of one-eyed monster with the head of the forest spirit attached onto it. You know how in the climax of Princess Mononoke, a god with the body of a deer and a face of a monkey called the forest spirit comes out. It's a drawing of one-eyed monster who is wearing its crown. This pattern was drawn in order to pass on the story of Ashitaka to future generations. Now, one eye stands for forging iron. In the past, people who lived in the mountains forged iron by mining for iron ore and iron sand and melting them. Because they stared at those burning forges with one eye closed, eventually all of them became blind. That's why there are many legends all over Japan which claim that there are one-eyed monsters living in mountains, and those legends usually originate from places where you could find mines. So think of it as a rule in Japan that blacksmiths are always one-eyed. And this picture represents a blacksmith who lost one eye. Meanwhile, it also represents that the person in the picture killed a god of the forest and received its horn. Miyazaki was thinking Ashitaka Seki as the movie title, not Princess Mononoke. The word Seki is a word made up by Miyazaki, which means legend. So the movie title was supposed to be like The Legend of Ashitaka. If this was the title, then people would have thought, oh, then Ashitaka is the main guy. But at one point, the title changed. I actually experienced something similar when I made a movie called Royal Space Force The Wings of Ani Amis. At first, our sponsor, Bandai, told us to title it The Wings of Rikuni. I said, no, she's not the main character, and that's so misleading. But they wanted a title like Naushika of the Valley of the Wind, you know, somebody off something. So they said, let's just go with the wings of Rikuni because she does get wings in a figurative way. And said, the audience is going to find out that she's not really the main character, so it's going to be okay. Well, no, it's not okay to do such things. And that has been proven by how the movie title changed to Princess Mononoke. It changed the impression of the viewers a great deal. And Miyazaki hated this idea. Just imagine if Naushika of the Valley of the Wind is suddenly titled Giant Monster Omi. What would you think? If that was the title, people are gonna think, oh, this must be a story where people fight this monster Omu, or question, who's gonna beat this monster and how, or wonder, so, those Omu go back to the forest, but they're still alive, so who's gonna fight them next? You see, people start expecting a movie like Godzilla. On the other hand, what if Godzilla was titled The Agony of Dr. Serizawa? Then again, it sounds like a totally different work, like a literary work. That's how much impact titles hold on work. The Legend of Ashitaka would have been an easier title for the audience to understand the movie better, but too bad, now it's called Princess Mononoke. So instead, Miyazaki left many cautionary notes by inserting scenes that were identical to Naushika to tell us, hey guys, you know what these mean, don't misunderstand. But his guidance is too advanced for the average people like us to comprehend. And it's the same with this scene, Miyazaki must have been like, come on, everybody's gonna realize that this means Jomon culture, but of course we do not realize that. And because it's a clay mask, we can also think the story of Ashitaka was told to future generations by either the descendants of Kaya, a former fiancé who stayed in the Emishi village or the descendants of San.
So this clay mask is trying to say something like, acknowledge the greatness of Ashitaka, the prince of our clan. Now in the next scene, the main character Ashitaka appears. The village girls tell Ashitaka, something strange is happening at the outskirt of the village. So Ashitaka climbs up to the watchtower. There he sees a Tatari god or a demon break in Dorui or earthwork fortification and enter into the village. This is how the Tatari god looks like in this scene. This is the picture from above. You see how the Tatari god has many legs and crawls on the ground in a furious speed. And see how their legs are surprisingly long? A Tatari god is not a single creature, but a state where numerous monstrous beings that look like snakes or earthworms cling onto a giant wild boar. The reason why you can't tell whether it has six or eight legs is because it represents a demon spider. So what's a demon spider? It's a derogatory term for the powerful families or native tribes who disobey the imperial family. People curse them by saying they're demon spiders. There's a legend that those who disobey the imperial families were defeated by Minamoto no Yorimitsu as monsters who attempted to turn Japan into a world of demons. Miyazaki depicts a world where the story of Ashitaka defeating a huge spider becomes distorted over time and in the end authorities turn it into a story about General Minamoto defeating a demon spider. But it's supposed to be a joke for Miyazaki rather than a serious interpretation. But once again, because it's too advanced, we don't get it. And from around the time he made Princess Mononoke, he became Isao Takahata-ish, meaning he started creating his work without thinking whether people would get it or not. That's because he learned that if he made everything easy to understand, then he would lose the inner energy to want to make something. So since then, Miyazaki became not mean, but a creator who makes everything that he wants to make but does not explain them all. After Princess Mononoke, he started saying there's nothing that cannot be shown. Kids need to see everything, even something harsh, but I won't show them in a straightforward manner. As a result, the way he depicted the demon spider makes it hard for us to notice it. It's like Miyazaki winking at us and hinting, speaking of demon spiders, they're about the barbarians in Tohoku region, right? Or they're used as a metaphor for the extermination of barbarians in the picture scrolls of Heian era, shouldn't everyone know that? Now, to help the girls who were attacked by the Tatari god, Ashitaka kills it with a bow. First, he shoots one of its eyes, then between the eyebrows to kill it. As a result, the curse of the Tatari god wraps around Ashitaka's right arm like a snake, leaving a black bruise. This whole sequence is shown very quickly, in the first three minutes. After that, the wise woman or Hisama in Japanese, which means princess, and who is the elder of the village, rushes to the site. Then the wise woman tells the Tatari god, whose slimy stuff has come off and who has turned back into the giant wild boar, the huge wild boar god who is about to die suddenly starts talking. Disgusting little creatures, soon all of you will feel my hate and suffer as I have suffered and it disintegrates. When he does that, the voice of the wild boar is so deep and rich. It's because, adding to the usual microphone, the voice actor had another microphone taped onto his throat, which picked up the vibration of the throat as well as the voice simultaneously. And they mixed the voice and the vibration to create the effect. Therefore, the breathing sounds contribute to the eeriness of the line which says, disgusting little creatures. After saying that the wild boar god disintegrates in a very grotesque way. When it dissolves, you can see the teeth exposed which makes it look like it's smiling. This is the genius of Miyazaki. Miyazaki started drawing scenes from part A, so the depiction of part A and part B is simply just beautiful. The first one hour of the movie is just amazingly drawn. The wild boar god is then reduced to bones, and Ashitaka is cursed by its last word, I will curse you. Now, a meeting is held that night inside the shrine of the village. If you look inside this shrine, you can see a rock sticking out in the center of the wall. 
This is a sacred body of worship. The villagers have built a raised floor style shrine attached to the rock. And do you see a desk in front of the rock that stretches out? There's a very low table, right? I know it's kind of hard to see because it's in the shadow of Ashitaka. In other words, the wise woman who serves gods always sits facing this rock. Therefore, it is clear that this rock is a sacred body of worship. At the end of the scene, Ashitaka cuts off his top knot. Even then, Ashitaka puts the top knot on top of this desk after cutting it off, bows and leaves. So it's clear that it's a sacred object. And this is important because the village enshrining a rock means that a megalithic civilization still remains there. In fact, something that looks like Stonehenge was found in Aomori, so we know that Ashitaka's village is far back in Tohoku region today. And there are people who disobeyed Yamato imperial court. The time when Japanese people enshrined huge rocks was long long before the introduction of Buddhism to Japan. Like in Buddhism, it is considered evil in Jomon world to worship something man-made, or people themselves, or wise people who finished religious training. The world view of Jomon people is like, what's really amazing is in nature, so what the hell are you doing worshipping mere humans, or why appreciate things that only humans made? But Jomon people were kind of strange, because while they said that, they also made those super cool looking earthenware. Anyway, so they worship megaliths as their divine symbol. And you can see a piece of Jomon pottery in the back of the room too. The fact that there is a piece of Jomon pottery here is a more obvious evidence than talking about megalithic culture that these people are the survivors of Jomon people. So, uh, please think that Princess Mononoke is a story about Jomon people. Now when Ashitaka is told to show the wound on his arm and takes off the bandage, this is how the wound looks like. In a cut that shows his arm with scars, you can also see Jomon pottery drawn in the background in the obvious way. By showing the Jomon pottery, Miyazaki is saying they're Jomon people, okay? But there is one more function to this. The winding scar on Ashitaka's arm, the pattern of Jomon pottery, and the sneaky stuff crawling all over the Tatari god's body all look alike. And Deidara Bachi, or the Night Walker, who comes out in the climax, also has this Jomon patterns wriggling inside its body. If you see the character reference, it says, the Night Walker looks like the night sky is walking. It also resembles a walking Jomon pottery. What I'm trying to say is that we unconsciously see Ashitaka's cursed arm and think it's making him suffer or he's gonna die soon because of it. But the pattern of the scar that we see with the pottery is actually the signature of Jomon gods. In other words, it is a sign that Ashitaka is cursed, but at the same time also given a stigma by the gods. He of course becomes a Tatari god because of this curse, but he also gains superpower. After receiving this bruise, the wise woman starts calling Ashitaka Ashitaka Hiko. This Hiko is the honorific title given to an ancient prince. The wise woman is the religious leader of this country, in short, so she acknowledged that Ashitaka Hiko is the one who will be the future leader of this country. In other words, Princess Mononoke is a story where a future king of the country is given a curse that can also be a stigma. Ashitaka has no choice but to leave the village because he is cursed. So he cuts off his top knot. All the men in the village have top knots on their heads, but Ashitaka cuts it off. The action indicates that he is no longer a member of the family, equals he can never come back home. And the wise woman explains why he has to do it. Here, 
Please pay attention to the expression of the wise woman. She says, There's evil at work in the land to the west. Prince Ashitaka, it's your fate to go there and see what you can see with eyes unclouded by hate. You may find a way to lift the curse. After hearing these words, Ashitaka decides to go west. At the same time, we are also somehow convinced, or should I say, deceived by them. Why does Ashitaka have to leave the village in the first place? And why is the wise woman trying to make Ashitaka go west? I mean, she's saying, you may find a way to break the curse, but I was thinking, how does she know that? That's the first important point of the movie. Ashitaka is cursed and his right arm is scarred. This poison will eventually reach the bones and kill him, so he travels west to escape death. We have been forced into thinking that's how this story goes just until now. But if that's the case, there's no need to exile him in the first place. Because the wise woman says, we will make a tomb at where Tatariga died and pray for its soul. Well, you might think, no, no, that's not gonna work. Because the monster said, I will continue to curse you even after I die. However, in this movie, there are many gods such as the god of dogs or wild boars, but none of them actually curses after death. All the gods who come out in the movie certainly have huge powers, and they're all big, but that's it. They can't use any supernatural power like telepathy. Well, only the forest spirit has this mysterious power, but there's no depiction that other gods have such thing. And there isn't a single scene where dead gods leave curses that continue after death. Both Okoto and Moro die in the movie, but nothing happens afterwards. So there's no curse after death in this fictional world. Then why is Ashitaka exiled? There's only one answer. It's because the wise woman wants to exile him. The reason why the wise woman talks to Ashitaka about the curse in such a poker face is because she's acting. Neither the villagers nor Ashitaka notice it, but there is an unspoken intention only in her mind. The real consequence of Ashitaka's curse is not that he dies, but he becomes another Tatari god. From this point, Ashitaka is slowly turning into a Tatari god. Just like the monster that has attacked the village a little while ago, his pain and suffering gradually becomes unbearable and he begins to curse his fate. The wild boar god who attacks the village also must have controlled the curse with his reason at first, but gradually becomes the Tatari god. In the same manner, Ashitaka is destined to be the next Tatari god. Later, in a battle, he shoots his arrow normally but he shows a monstrous power and the arrow tears off the opponent's samurai's both arms. When he shoots the next arrow, it easily chops off the opponent's head, which surprises Ashitaka himself. This is because at this point he's given a sacred power which is also cursed. The power of the curse invites Ashitaka to a suffering that leads to death, while the sacred power increases his strength infinitely. Is when Ashitaka feels anger or sadness or something illogical, he gains infinite power. We only see scenes where Ashitaka manages to control and uses his infinite power at will and think that's all there is. But they definitely portray the process of Ashitaka gradually becoming a monster. In fact, the conflict of whether Ashitaka can survive as a human or become a Tatari god is another substructure that's hidden in the story. However, it is now very noticeable. After all, I think why people can't notice it is because the movie was titled Princess Mononoke, which made the piece look like a romance movie. But it's not a romance, it's a story about Ashitaka, it's really the legend of Ashitaka. Ashitaka has despair and anger in his mind, but on the surface, he shows no emotion and acts gently. And Miyazaki said that in this movie, he decided not to portray Ashitaka's inner despair and anger. 
The reason for that is because while he was making the movie, he talked to Ryotaro Shiba, a novelist, and was deeply impressed by what Shiba said, and thought, I got it! People who complain so easily are wimps! Now I see why I hate Hideaki Anno's Evangelion! The tiny little wimp keeps on whining, I'm unfortunate, I'm unfortunate! Shiba told him, people who are truly unfortunate do not whine, but they rather become well-mannered. Miyazaki was so impressed and that became the inspiration. That's why Ashitaka's inner voices are not spoken through lines unlike Dora in Castle in the Sky who speaks to herself, this might be more convenient. As a result, the depiction of Ashitaka progressively becoming a monster is shown through pictures, but we somehow see that as a superhero using superpower. But that's not how it should be seen. There's a scene where Ashitaka bends the opponent's sword with just one finger and at the end breaks it with his thumb and index finger. But that expression clearly shows how his anger goes out of control and becomes monstrous. At first, Ashitaka also calms down and controls his mind. Even when he's told rudely to leave the village, he just sighs and says, okay. But in the latter half of the movie, his power goes out of his control more and more when he becomes emotional. And the wise woman is the only person in the village who notices it. It is not the dead Tatari god that she is afraid of. It is Ashitaka who would one day lose human nature and turns into a Tatari god that she's most afraid of. That's why she thinks Ashitaka is a good boy and would have taken over our village and become a good king. But now he will become a monster because of the pain and resentment and the anger towards the absurdity that has descended upon him. Let's kick him out of the village before that happens. On top of that, the wise woman plans to send this young man who will become a Tatari god to the king of Yamato in the west who imposed a curse on our village. Jomon people thought that curses were something that must be given back to someone. They called it imigaishi, a type of retaliation. It was a rule between uncivilized tribes that if they received hatred from others, they would curse them back. This rule became more systematic during Heian era and was called Shikigami Gaishi or returning of fierce god. So the wise woman, with her perfect poker face, operates a retaliation against the country of Yamato in the west by sending Ashitaka as a strategic weapon. But neither Ashitaka nor the villagers are aware of this at all. So you can see, the true intentions in Princess Mononoke are hard to read, because the movie does not clarify the thoughts or strategies of each individual, but is designed in a way that makes the viewer see the story only from Ashitaka's point of view. Now, we're on to what all of you have been waiting for, how Princess Mononoke is very naughty. After Ashitaka's exile is decided, Kaya, a girl who admires and loves him, stops him at the exit of the village. Here, Kaya confesses her love and says, I'll be longing you forever, and gives Ashitaka a small dagger made of obsidian. When Ashitaka receives it, he gives this super handsome smile and says, Me too, I will always think about you. This line by Ashitaka actually means, I will not fall in love with anyone else in the future for the rest of my life. And Ashitaka, who receives the crystal dagger, says in such a good-looking smile, that's why quite a lot of female audience don't like this scene, or they say, that's what I hate about Ashitaka. It's because a girl gives him a confession of a lifetime, which he responds to with a handsome smile, also receives a dagger made of precious obsidian from her. And without any hesitation, he later gives it to another girl, Sam who has the exact same voice as Kaya, which is no surprise because they are both voiced by the same actress, Yuriko Ishida. Not only that, he gives it through a dog. Instead of giving it to her directly, he's like, give this to San, please, and the dog is like, yes, sir. And then when the dog gives it to San, she's like, oh, beautiful. And she makes this romantic facial expression. And those lady audience watch this scene and be like, what is wrong with this anime? Sure, it's natural 
natural for them to get mad. And at the end of the movie, they say to each other, Hey, I'll come and see you again sometime. Oh yeah, come, come. And we're like, the curse is removed, so stop flirting. Go home and meet Kaya. And this anguished voice that says, Hurry up and come back to the village is even written on Ghibli's official guidebook. <laughs> In this book title, Ghibli's textbook, Princess Mononoke, which is an official book by Ghibli, a female writer wrote, This is what I find unacceptable about Ashitaka. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I get the anger, but in fact, the scene with Kaya at the exit of village is not what you think it is. Everything that's depicted works as a symbol. This is what I explained earlier that in Princess Mononoke, Miyazaki created the movie with the mind that he will depict everything that was necessary, but not in a way that everybody gets it. In Ashitaka and Kaya's village, the fact a woman goes to see a man in the middle of the night alone would be considered that they had a physical relationship. Moreover, Kaya does not say, take me with you, or complain about Ashitaka leaving. That's because they already had sex and she has conceived a child. Ashitaka's bloodline remains in this village and Kaya inherits it. In other words, if you ask Miyazaki, he'd say, if you watch this scene and can't figure out, you'll never understand my movie in the first place. I mean, how the hell are we supposed to figure that out? <laughs> Therefore, the reason why the design which represents Ashitaka as a symbol of greatness of our ancestors is carved onto the clay mask on the title screen is because Kaya left Ashitaka's bloodline in this Jomon village. Later, Miyazaki spoke in an interview as many people asked about this. A female writer and a female Ghibli staff members asked him, why did Ashitaka keep flirting with Sun instead of going back to Kaya, who was waiting for him in a village? Miyazaki responded to their questions since said, well, after the story was over, Ashitaka might have returned to that village. He might even have taken Sun with him to the village. He might have taken Sun home, let Kaya meet her and married both of them, because the story takes place in that kind of a world. This is that kind of story. It's a story about a royal family. I just didn't depict them in the movie. But modern day people have to be explained to think, so he's a king during ancient Japan? Then okay, maybe it's natural. Otherwise, we have to apply our modern perspective to the story and think, he takes son home and marry both girls? What the hell? Now while Ashitaka is traveling after talking to Kaya and leaving the village, the day breaks. At the same time, the music becomes very dramatic. And in the background, you see such a beautiful landscape of dawn. Now, Ashitaka's mind is darkened by despair, anger, and sorrow. Because Ashitaka is polite, he follows the order of leaving the village by saying, yes, I will. But his mind is filled with questions like, why do I have to go through this? I saved the village, I saved the girls. He's so furious and so sad that he is shaking because it is too much to bear. But he didn't want Kaya who sent him off to the journey to see his emotions and worry her. That's why when he says, I will always think about you, Kaya, he gives such a bright smile. He's forcing out a smile in that scene. That's why his face looks more cheerful than it really should be. He should be looking sad because it is supposed to be an eternal breakup with his fiancée. But because he thought, I mustn't look sad, he responds to Kaya who looks sad with a smile smile that makes him look as if he's happy. And that's the sorrow this young man has. So I want to reward him for his good spirit. I want to give him the best morning he ever had for his departure. So please, please draw a tremendously beautiful landscape for this scene. Mr. Hisaishi, please compose an amazing piece of music for this scene. Because our Ashitaka is that kind of a guy. Isn't he a good man? Even when his mind is darkened, he still lives strongly. Don't you want to tell such a boy, in this world there's something beautiful even in the midst of despair? And but, and the reason why I say but is because such passion or inner feelings don't really get transmitted to the audience.
It looks like Ashitaka is saying to Kaya with a happy smile, "Yeah, thanks. I'll keep thinking about you," and cheerfully runs off on a half horse, half looking animal. The music in the background here is titled "The Legend of Ashitaka," which he says she wrote with all his might, because such a magnificent piece of music is being played with the beautiful landscape in the background. It somehow looks as if Ashitaka started a journey in a happy mood. Miyazaki meant to say. Despite the dark despair he feels, the world is still beautiful. But it makes the audience think you are having fun, right? As those ladies point out. And again, it's because of the title that was changed to Princess Mononoke. It sounds like a romance movie title, and the story makes you look at it and think Ashitaka is moving on from this plain village girl to a better girl. Doesn't that make you excited with this dramatic music in the background? So it's such. Such a simple title. Yeah, someone just wrote in the comment. Miyazaki trusted the audience too much. But the possible reason why this movie made a hit was that when something strange like that happens in the movie, the movie usually bombs. But somehow, Princess Mononoke made a mega hit, and many people went to the theaters again and again. It means that people felt something contradicted, and they watched it many times to confirm what contradicted. Which must have contributed to the sales of the movie. So for now, just remember that Ashitaka wasn't a prick who toyed with the girl's feeling and gave a precious dagger gifted by her to another woman.